In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're at Discover UH Manoa, checking out the 2023 School of Ocean and Earth, Science and Technology Open House. Your university right here in your backyard is a world-class university with something for everybody. With over 80 exhibits, activities, demonstrations, and tours, SOAST Open House is an amazing place to learn about the important research and exciting opportunities available for students and the community. Join us as we explore deep sea robots, take pictures with the Mars rover, fish for knowledge, touch marine invertebrates, check out the prey items of pelagic fishes, scan for radioactivity, climb inside a whale, simulate a volcano, and so much more. Yeah, so we brought some of our underwater vehicles for everybody to look at. It's just a little flavor of all the different types that we have. So this is a sea glider, this is a wire walker, and that one where there's a profiling float. Mostly the, uh, they are optically based, so they have lasers that depending on the color of the laser, it will tell you something different about what's in the water. So they're all designed for different purposes. They all profile the water in different ways. This one kind of goes in a sawtooth pattern in the, in the ocean. And it can be piloted, so you can tell it exactly where to go, so it's pretty cool. They all have temperature sensors, salinity sensors, uh, pressure sensors to see how deep you're going. And they also all have oxygen sensors. If you notice that none of them have propellers, they work with their internal buoyancy. So they, they inflate bladders, they pump oil in and out to try to change the buoyancy and you know inflate to go to the surface, deflate to go to the depth. So they are, they are very good at conserving energy and they can stay out for a long time. The profiling flows can stay out for about five years if you're, if you're careful with your mission and everything. So they are long-term as assets for us. What are some of the things that you've discovered or been able to understand using your tools? So there's there's so much stuff. So we're able to get to actually, if we profile those uh, profiling flows multiple times a day, we can see this uh, rise and fall of oxygen production in the ocean or carbon production in the ocean. So we can calculate how much oxygen is being produced by those algae, which we, there's no other way to get them because you know they're just really hard measurements. Many of those those uh, instruments as well, like uh, they they ha they, they have been one of the first ways that we've been able to see that the deep ocean is warming up. So we can have like signals of climate change from these profiling flows because they are they are there's so many of them now and they are everywhere and they're really accurate. So we can start mapping where climate change is happening and we see this happening really deep in the water column already. So it's not just the University of Hawaii that has floats like this, there's other the entire world. So there's a huge consortium of people who buy them through grants and then deploy them and the data is always free available so anyone can use them you know you buy them and you deploy them but everybody else can benefit from the data that's been uh, produced you can see like where all these floats are they're all over the world and all different countries the US is a big contributor to all these floats but there are I think at least 40 countries involved that are uh, contributing data to this how many gliders or autonomous vehicles do you think are in the Pacific Ocean yeah, so at least right now, profiling floats, there's probably about 2,000. Uh, and all of these little dots, they are all the uh, where they are right now. Yeah, all, all the these key little string dots. Dot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so wow. there are a lot of them. All right, Emily. What do we have today? So here we have lancetfish prey. Lancetfish are a deep sea fish. They can be found up to 3,000 meters below the surface and they can grow to be over six feet long. Lancetfish are the number one bycatch on the tuna long line. And what's interesting about them is that they don't digest their prey in their stomach. They digest their prey in their small intestine. So their stomach essentially acts as a storage organ and preserves all of their prey perfectly. And so what I have here is a bunch of different prey items. They kind of act as this net 
net that goes around and captures things that we can't necessarily capture. We get them from the longliners and cut up their stomachs and get to see what they eat. How cool. Yeah, so they do actually share a couple of prey items in common with billfish and tuna, which are you know species that we care about and we eat. About 9% of lancet fish contain some sort of marine debris, usually in the form of shards, plastic shards, rope, twine, um, but this is the most ridiculous thing I've seen. That must have been a big lancet fish. Yeah, it was It was pretty big. Not big enough to pass this, so. <laughs> That's really cool, and they're just naturally out there sampling the whole ocean for you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and what do you have on this side of the table? So this side we have larval fish on display. We have also deep sea fish, oceanic species, shallow reef species. And so we've gone out on ships and used um, noosed on toes, collect along the surface, and we look through plankton, pick out the fish, identify the fish, and this helps us learn about the plankton community and how also how those distributions might change over time, what kind of species are out there, you know, and this really helps us keep track of the fish that we care about. So here we have larval mahi-mahi, larval tuna, omilu, and so we get to learn about the fish that we care about and the fish that we eat, but from a small scale. I'm part of the Pelagic Research Program in the Ecosystem Sciences Division, and so we kind of study things on an ecosystem scale, how one thing affects another, how things are all tied into a food web. So what do we have going on today, Leo? Oh, actually we are uh, going to show like kids how aquifer will be contaminated by like river that is contaminated by contaminants, something like that, yeah. So different stuff people put into the watershed, gets into the river and gets down into our drinking water. Yes, and how we can remove those like contaminants from the aquifer so oh. that we can get clean water that we can drink. about your exhibit today. We've got an exhibit about is it Earth or Mars? We have really similar landscapes on both Earth and Mars. So this is just to give people a sense of the kind of things we see on both planets and the similarities and differences. The Mars 2020 Perseverance rover landed in 2021. It's been exploring Jezero Crater since then. And we're currently making our way towards the crater rim of Jezero Crater. And we're hoping that the rover keeps going for many years to come and we keep getting exciting images from Mars. So there's not a plan to bring it back to Earth? There is, we are taking samples right now with the rover and there's a plan to bring those samples back to Earth. And when will they get back? It's still a bit to be determined, but hopefully sometime in the early 2030s. And what is your role with the Mars rover? Me, alongside my PhD supervisor, Sarah Fagents, we're part of the MassCamZ camera team. We help with um, operations, that means helping decide what kind of pictures we take and also analyzing the data that we get back. Some of the most scientifically interesting images, we've seen examples of lava flows on the Jezero crater, that's where the, the Perseverance rover is. And I really like looking at those kind of things because it's like seeing the kind of things that we see in Hawaii, but on Mars, which is always really fun. Is the Mars rover still there, taking pictures, sending them back now? Yes. And so you're actively getting to decide where it's going and what it's taking pictures of? Yeah, so we have an overall plan and a big science team that helps make all these decisions. Um, but specifically for our instrument, um, we have a lot of input on the kind of things that are useful to take images of. You know, we get to say, okay, that rock looks interesting, let's take a picture of that, that kind of thing, which is really, alongside our colleagues on the instrument team, is really interesting. What do you hope to do next? Um, so I want to stay in um, scientific research. I want to stay involved in planetary science missions. So I'd love either to work at a place like the University of Hawaii is really good because it does that science research and also has involvement with missions and other places like that. Tell me about where you work. I work at uh, Hanamu Bay Nature Preserve. It's a very beautiful place. It is a conservation area, which means that everything is protected. So there's no fishing allowed, no spear fishing. Um, so yeah, lots of beautiful fish out there. Because it's protected. Protected, yes. Marine Life Conservation District area. 
Tell me about your exhibit today. So today we have an exhibit called Fishing for Knowledge, um, where a lot of our participants will have a small fishing pole, and they catch a lot of these native fish that we do have out there. Um, this is a white saddle goldfish. We do have a Christmas wrasse and a convict tang or manini. All these you can see out in Hanamo Bay. And do you see these when you go snorkeling Yes, out I there? do. I see them all the time. Um, they're very beautiful. And what are some of the things that you're trying to teach people that come by and want to learn about Hanama? I'm trying to teach them about conservation, be conservation-minded when they're out in the water. Look, but don't touch. Don't take anything from the reef. If you want to enjoy open house, what's your recommendation? Visit all the exhibits. There are a lot of cool exhibits here, especially come to ours, you know. Um, and I hope you guys can come out to Hanawa Bay itself. Thank you. The University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. You're watching Voice of the Sea. We're at the 2023 SOAS Open House. Today we are here at the SOAS Open House. And what we're exhibiting here is a little bit about coastal adaptation. We hear a lot about shoreline erosion, beach erosion. What we've tried to demonstrate here with these bins is a very small scale coastal environment where you might have a seawall and we show by moving the waves back and forth how that seawall will erode the beach. It will accelerate erosion in front of the beach. And then we have examples of a home that's situated along the shoreline with no seawall. And what happens when you start to throw waves at it, the home fails because it's not protected. You could also say that maybe it's situated too close to the shoreline. And then we do have an example of a tea head groin. This is one type of shoreline structure that's used to stabilize beaches where having a beach is the most important thing. Take Waikiki, for example, where uh, having a beach is a really critical part of the plan. There are other places that are proposing similar type of work in West Maui, in the Kahana area. They're proposing tea head groins where they have ongoing erosion, threatening condominiums and things like that. It might be appropriate in places like that where retreat, like moving away from the shoreline, is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind. It might be a longer term strategy. We have examples here of different types of materials that are used in erosion control. Typically a groin would be made out of rock or concrete, but sometimes there's a situation where we want something that's more temporary and there's different types of um, reinforced materials. You can see it's like a um, plastic coated reinforced mesh. These would work well in a situation where you have an emergency. And this one is a very common material that's used for sandbags. These are meant to be very large, like the size of this table, and they weigh hundreds of pounds, so they stay put and they're strapped together. We actually have a groin in Waikiki that's made out of this material, sandbags that are made out of this material. It seems to be working really well, but it's not meant to be there forever either. So <clears throat> that's the idea with these is you can literally cut them open. Oh, sure, and, and then the, the sand, sand goes out. That's right. I put these out just in case somebody was wondering like what's in between moving away from the coast and building groins. This might be something that's more intermediate. A lot of these structures are meant to buy time until we can figure out a longer term strategy. The beeping that I have kind of going on behind me is what we call a Geiger counter. It's used for surveying. We use it in the lab too to make sure that we're being as safe as possible, that kind of thing. And every time it makes a chirping or a beeping noise, it's picking up on natural radiation that exists in the environment. And so we can use this, these measurement devices to trace radiation or radioactive decay in the environment. So every time it beeps, it's collecting something. It's happening all the time, you're good, I'm good. But if I use something like potassium, potassium 40 specifically. Your salt is radioactive. Yeah. 
because naturally. it's naturally. So the basalt here in Hawaii has a tremendous amount of potassium-40 in it. Bananas will also be radioactive. Brazilian nuts will also be radioactive naturally. Does that mean naturally. they're bad for you? In high doses, if you were to consume a tremendous amount, it would take a lot, kind of like x-rays. If you did 100 x-rays this year, that would be very bad for your body in terms of the energy that you're taking on, but one x-ray really isn't. Or UV radiation from the sun sure. can damage your skin. Same premise. Too much exposure without any protection, that's bad. These are just to show that it's naturally in the environment all the time. And as scientists, we have to be uh, conscious that these exist so that when we're looking for something else, we know to be aware that this is also in the environment and not mistake it for what we're really looking for. When we see this red peak here, this is peak right here is potassium 40 specific. So each uh, radiation decay that we have has a specific energy to it, which is basically like a forensic signature. One of the more recent things that we've been asked about is the recent release in Japan uh, because of the affluent from Fukushima okay. and that release. And so we are monitoring that. Uh, so you guys are monitoring the water around Hawaii mm -hmm. to make sure that there's no extra radiation or radiation that we are not aware of coming yes. from that event. And to be able to source out whether or not that's a historic event, like something like the Marshall Islands, or whether that's a recent event like Fukushima. We're always monitoring kind of the waters around Hawaii specifically. We've also done soils, we can do plants as well. Just kind of depends what we're looking for, what we're interested in, um, and, and what we think is relevant for the, for the public to know more about. And then these are some of the kinds of rocks that you The colors of the minerals in there, they change, right? We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. You're watching Voice of the Sea. We're at the 2023 SOAS Open House. We are a group of students from the Kiwala Marine Lab and we have set up a touch tank exhibit. All of these animals were collected from tide pools on Oahu. Most of them are organisms that you could easily find in the tide pools here. So these are a type of sea cucumber here. There's actually two types here. And then we have brittle stars. They, um, they can break their arms off to get away from predators and then they can regrow them. In here we have collector urchins and they have lots and lots of tube feet so they can stick themselves onto surfaces and they won't get pushed away by the waves. And then we have some anemones. These are all snails. And this is all hermit crabs in here. This has probably been the favorite of the day. The kids love the hermit crabs. They love holding them on their hands. They're really tickly. This tank's getting a little messy because of the sand, but we actually have a piece of marine debris that was found covered in these barnacles. You usually don't find those gooseneck barnacles except floating on marine debris. And then we also have this huge sea hare, which is a type of sea slug. And I'm not gonna pick it up because it will ink everywhere. It actually has purple ink that comes out. So they're named sea hares because they kind of look like little bunnies. We work in the Diamond Anvil Cell Lab. We have water and we are making hot pressed ice. There's all different types of ice. And this one right here is one of the ices that we make that can be hot. We have two diamonds and in between those, that's where we are able to squish different materials. We increase high temperatures and high pressures on our samples. As you can see here, we can reach pressures similar to the mantle or the core. 
Of the Earth. Of the Earth, or other planets. I am actually looking at Mercury right now. You study Mercury. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the uh, mantle convection in Mercury. What do you do with the ice, this hot ice? We can study its density, its electric conductivity, thermal conductivity. All of these give us insights into how the minerals or materials behave. That can actually be applicable to other planets, but also to totally different fields like engineering or, you know, material science. I think it might be. Insects have what's called compound eyes, right? So they're made up of many of these little different rose sets, and like that's how insects see. So they have many of these eyes, and they also are covered with lots of different hairs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like larger hairs are uh, like we're, we're sensing, and all the smaller ones as well. And so here we go. And as we zoom in on the eye, you'll see it's kind of interesting. There are hairs in the eyes. then it houses a little coral polyp. If it just has irregular holes, then it's probably coral and algae. Both of these break down and make up sand. This is a coral reef in Papahana here, and then we can link these 3D um, structures and metrics data to fish and coral communities. You inhale from this side, you exhale on this side, and then on the back, you have this CO2 absorbent that's stored inside this unit. With these two little cylinders, you can stay underwater for hours. All of these new algaes that are new to science and new fish that the thigh name are in that kind of two to three hundred foot range. And that's basically what I do for, for the monument as a marine biologist and a deep sea diver. Today we're trying to get the word out about a community science project. We're asking volunteers from the general public to photograph their coastlines during the king tide. This is the highest high tide of the whole year. And the reason why this is important is we're learning a lot about the local impacts of sea level rise from photographs that get sent in. And we're also hearing ideas for how community members want to adapt. And it's not just here in Hawaii, people can take pictures all across the Pacific? People can take pictures all across the Pacific. We have photos from the Hawaiian Islands, American Samoa, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and even some photographs from Papa Hanamokuakea. Researchers have put together this map and it's a model that you can flood to different levels. And the cool thing about the King Tides project is it helps to ground truth and verify where the model shows flooding. Uh, so we can look at, um, for example, Waikiki, and we have these local examples of what sea level rise impacts look like. Imagine you go to a beach every single week for your whole life. Right. You have a lot of information and knowledge about what that coastline looks like on a quote unquote normal day and what that coastline looks like on a king tide day. And so what we're asking people to do is to photograph the places that they know the best so that we can learn what sea level rise looks like at the local level. We'd love photographs from rural areas of Hawaii. We have a lot of photographs from Waikiki, but we're hoping to expand our knowledge of local impacts to other places in Hawaii. And do you need a fancy camera to participate in the project? You can use your smartphone if you visit pacios.org slash KT. That's how you upload the photographs and your written observations. And you can also take a picture on a digital camera and upload it and send it to us through your computer or your laptop. We look forward to seeing you at the next SOAST Open House. Visit voiceofthesea.org to learn more about the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa and find out about ways you can be part of ongoing scientific research in your community. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group 
the award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.